Hey everyone, welcome back to Celta Singularity. Um, <laughs> Cosmos is yelling out the window again right now in the background. But um, I'm excited to play this. It's been a little bit since I played this, so I think. Very loud pug over there. Um, <laughs> I think I'm close to being done with this one. I really want to play it though. Um, it's finals week for me as of when I'm recording this, so I haven't gotten a chance to play it yet, unfortunately, but I'm excited to play it for a little bit. Um, what is it about this guy that excites so much curiosity in humans? What do they hope to see up there? Explore James Webb Telescope. Yes, I want to do this. I'm not going to be able to get much done. Oh, I love the little honey girl mirrors. That's so cool. Um, yeah, there's only 15 hours left of this, so I'm definitely not going to be able to make a lot of progress with this, but uh, I'm still excited. Okay. <laughs> Alright, so I have both of these to read. Look at the stars. We have always looked at the stars with wonder. Curiosity about the cosmos inspires astounding feats of human ingenuity and collaboration as we strive to see farther and better than ever before. Yes. Okay. Let me see what these things are. Oh, it's showing all of them. Interesting. Okay. Um... Yeah, I'm definitely not going to be able to get most of these, but, okay, ground telescope. Uh, the earliest stargazers made their observations with nothing but the naked eye. Magnifying telescopes opened up whole new vistas, from simple handheld spyglasses to mountaintop observatories that can detect wavelengths invisible to humans. Mountaintop observatories are so cool. <laughs> I've been to one. I've been to more observatories than that, but in terms of, like, actual really big mountaintop ones, I've been to one. And it's pretty cool. <laughs> um, it's, it's so different being able to look through one of the really big telescopes in, like, a telescope dome rather than just, like, a personal... <laughs> Uh, telescope. Not to say that those aren't cool too. My family owns a lot of telescopes, but there's something just so much cooler about looking through one that's like, the one I've looked through at that observatory is a 36 inch, and to put that into perspective, the largest one that my family owns is two 8 inch ones, so just it's insane the, the comparison we looked at some really cool things we saw the needle nebula we saw we've seen a lot of really cool things um at that observatory they do like a tour of it that i got to go on twice um and i have a lot of astronomy shirts from there <laughs> It's Lick Observatory in um, California, just kind of near San Jose, and it's named after a guy who is actually buried under the telescope that we got to look through. Um, you can like go under, it's this really old kind of historic telescope dome, and in the in the dome there's the 36 inch telescope and the floor originally was a thing where it could raise and lower to uh, look through the telescope and the mechanism that does that isn't really safe to use anymore or it's not functioning I don't remember exactly the specifics but you can't really use that anymore so they just use one of those giant like metal rolling staircases but you can go down under that floor and there's a part with um, 
basically the base of the the like structural thing that's holding up the telescope and um the guy that the observatory is named after is just buried under there um okay origins in 1946, astrophysicist, uh, astrophysicist Lyman, Lyman, I'm not sure how to pronounce that name, uh, Spitzer made the first proposals for a telescope in space. He later, cel or he later collaborated with astronomer Nancy Grace Roman to develop the Hubble Space Telescope. I believe there is also a, teles a space telescope called Spitzer, which I would assume is named after him. That name sounds really familiar, and I'm pretty sure that's why. Okay. This is interesting, too, because compared to some of the others, this is much more, like, abstract lines, less, like, mushrooms growing on a log kind of thing. Anyway, um, I know it's supposed to be like a space telescope or something, but it's cool. Okay. Hubble Telescope. At its launch in 1990, the Hubble Space Telescope, named for astronomer Edwin Hubble, was the most powerful telescope ever built. Still in use today, it gave us some of our most iconic images of faraway galaxies and spectacular nebulas. Nice. Yeah. Okay. I will come back to that. I have things to do in these others. I'm hoping that I've been away long enough that I will have finished that one for beyond about having however much it was, 96 tillion or whatever it was, about the uh, 96 tillion for the... Um, it's the requirement so that I don't have to keep trying to save up for that. Um, also, all of these things are things that I'm pretty sure I've read in the past. If there's one I think I haven't, I will read it. But these I read before... Um, before I did the whole singularity thing. I don't know if I've read Hooves. Um, ungulates that live on land are identifiable by their hooved feet. Having feet covered in tough bone helps to enable these creatures to graze for extended periods and travel long distances over hard terrain. I don't know if I've read this one either. Uh, rumination. Ungulates have special four-chambered stomachs which allow food to be fermented in their stomachs prior to digestion. All right. Cool. Yeah, that is a new thing. Nice. Also, I don't know if I'm pronouncing undulates, ungulates, I don't know if that's right. But, um, alright. Let's see. I have read this one before. I have read this one before. Um, have I read this one before? I have, because I remember being confused about how to pronounce that word. <laughs> okay. I've read that one. Tusks, I don't think I've read. Uh, hippos have large lower canine and incisor teeth which grow into impressive tusks as they age. Combined with the hippo's incredibly powerful and flexible jaw, the bite of a hippopotamus is extremely dangerous. And now I can get hippopotamus. So that is... Oh. It looks... grumpy. <laughs> um, okay. A large semi-aquatic mammal, hippos are native to sub-Saharan Africa, where they are mostly herbivorous. Despite their resemblance to pigs, they are actually more closely related to marine animals such as whales and dolphins. Okay. Then, rabbits. 
Rabbits have powerful hind legs that they use for jumping and running. They live in social groups in underground burrows and have been domesticated as far back as ancient Rome. Today there are over 300 species of domestic rabbits, which are often kept as pets. My sister has two of them. I read this one already. I read this one already. Okay. Why 48? That's such a random percentage. Okay. Rabbits have nearly 360 degrees of vision due to the placement of their eyes in their skulls. This allows them to always be on the lookout for predators and potential threats. Alright. This is another random percentage. 96. Okay, rats. Living in tandem with humans, civilization. For thousands of years, rats are the ultimate opportunistic survivor. These furry rodents, larger than mice, will eat almost anything and are known vectors for disease and are highly intelligent. All right. Crocodilians have very sharp hearing. Special muscles help to protect their eardrums while they are underwater, making their hearing just as good above or below the surface. That's cool. I can get a crocodile now. Um, saltwater habitat. I read that before. Slow speed. I've read. I'm pretty sure. Okay. I think I need to <laughs> level up some of these first. Okay. Oh, there's a thing there. Um. I love the turtles so much. Yay, there are some more now. This is cool, having the new ones. I don't know if I've read this one. Um, gliers, a clade comprising of both lagomorphs, rabbits and hares, and rodents. The gliers are small mammals with distinctive teeth that grow continuously throughout their lifetime. Most are herbivores or insectivores, are small and furry, and have tails. Alright. I have read that one, and I have not read this one. Okay. Ungulates, ungulates, however you pronounce it, can be split into two groups. Terrestrial ungulates, I'm just gonna keep you saying it that way, <laughs> which share common traits of hooves and cetaceans, which have flippers and live in water. They are mostly grazing herbivores. That is very interesting <laughs> that they are, um, they're like the same type but in water and on land. Um, I don't know what is it. Oh, here it is. Okay. Raucous rodents. Rats enjoy being tickled. When tested, rats in a playful mood displayed happiness when they were observed to and were yeah. and were observed even oh my gosh i cannot read right now and were even observed to emit high-pitched giggles when tickled by scientists however anxious rats dislike being tickled just like humans what the heck i don't know <laughs> okay I'm waiting to go to beyond for last because I have high expectations for it and I don't want to do be disappointed. Hopefully. But also I've been away for so long that this one is satisfying to come back to. Yay. 
I'm also excited with this one because finally, after so long, every single thing I have is automated and I know for sure that as soon as I restart it, I'm probably gonna get another thing that will probably also take so long to actually automate, but that's just how it works, so. Oh, actually, I should probably do this one first, because I'm assuming it will produce more, because it's farther out. Um... I like that the collect, however many fossils, starts from the beginning, not just from when that one shows up as a thing to work on. That's very convenient. Alright, what things do I want to rank up? I will rank up a... ossification. is exciting. Proxima Centauri! Ah, yes! Okay, I should be able to finish this now, hopefully. Okay. Saturn. Okay. Europa. Yes. And this, so we'll see if I have enough. Should have put a ring on it. While all four of the outer planets have rings, only Saturn has a ring that is visible to the naked eye. Saturn's ring system is also much larger and more complex than those of Jupiter, Uranus, and Neptune. Correct. These guys are done. Yay, constellation fragments. Oh, I should have <laughs> done that first. Okay. I can rank up this. Oh, yes. Thank you, Saturn. This is very helpful. All right. Over and, and you and... This one. I need so much. <laughs> I'm so close. I just have to level up Vesta. Hopefully that happens soon. But I need to try and work on this because this one's ending soon. Um. All right. Pair mission. Okay. A flaw in Hubble's main mirror meant it couldn't resolve images properly at launch. After three years of fuzzy photos, 
NASA sent a crew to perform delicate orbital repairs in 1993. Four other manned missions have since visited to service the telescope. Okay, landmark discoveries. Hubble's observations have yielded many breakthroughs in astrophysics. Um, they revealed new celestial objects, located black holes at the center of galaxies, and helped determine the age of the universe. Yeah. I'm curious what shape this one is, because things have tended to be shaped like things related, like the... I kind of caught on to this during the music one, there was the one that was shaped like the treble clef, um, in terms of the layout of the things that you collect. So I'm curious what this one's going to be. I'd assume it's something related to James Webb or another space telescope, but I'm not 100% sure. <laughs> okay, none of these... These, I'm sure, are gonna be far away. <laughs> I don't think it's gonna be easy, but all of these are just one, which is interesting, because a lot of the other times it's like, level up the whatever to get 50 or 100 or whatever it is. Um... I want that one. I'm- <laughs> I don't wanna read it until I get it, just to keep track of what I've read or not, but yeah. I want to get the next one instead of leveling that at one up for now, but I want ah oh, so many things. Okay. I guess I should probably start talking about the most recent scientific thing in my class because that's what I've tended to do sometimes during these videos and it's finals week so I'm not gonna have these things to talk about for very much longer necessarily just because I won't be in classes this summer which is weird this is the first summer since 2019 that I have not taken classes in the summer. Saturn's about to finish? Yes! Okay. <laughs> anyway. Um, yeah, so I'm going to be not taking any classes, which is weird, but, um, it's interesting, because on last Friday, uh, which will be not at all when, um, <laughs> when this video comes out, but the Friday before finals week, um, we did a last lab, and it's for this class that I've had that's, like, six hours a day. This one, we only went for, like, four hours just because 
she was like, it's, it's finals week. I know you guys are all busy and have other things to study for and projects to finish. And she was also leaving to do a, like, be a guide on a rafting thing for, um, for a little week-long class that had, it was, should have happened earlier in the quarter, I think, but weather meant that it was rescheduled to pretty much finals week. Um, but because of that, um, it was like four hours, but we went out to this little farm that the university has, and essentially we went and we got to uh, try and take soil samples, which was really interesting, but it meant that um, basically it was it was weird. So we try to do this in like the second week of June or like the first whole week of June, I guess. Um, June seventh is when it happened. But my teacher had always tried to do the soil lab earlier in the year, in the past, and so <laughs> she was like, oh, okay, note to self, we definitely need to do this earlier in the other years because it essentially made all of the soil so dry, it was so hard to take samples. Um, also, I am absolutely getting dog domestication now. Well, actually, hang on. Ooh. I might as well actually just finish up the, well, not finish up, because there's this one, but finish the beyond things that I can currently get, and then get the dogs after, I think, is what I'll do. Um, that might be... A better option especially because I'm so close to getting Vesta and I just I need to try and do that so yeah Russell's teapot is a thought experiment that posits a teapot orbiting between Earth and Mars too small to detect it argues that the burden of proof is on those making unfalsifiable claims not on skeptics inability to disprove doesn't mean we should assume it exists. Whoa, okay, I've never heard about this before. Do they mean, like, an actual teapot? Because I thought when it was a teapot, it was going to be talking about how Sagittarius looks like a teapot. But this is something different. I've never heard of this. Also, the line inability to disprove doesn't mean we should assume it exists. I know it's different, but it reminds me of Carl Sagan's quote. I believe it was Carl Sagan, I'm pretty sure. Um, evidence, or, yeah. Evidence of absence is not, or absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. That's the way that quote goes, uh, which is about whether or not there is extraterrestrial life. This is weird, though. What the heck? It, like, an actual teapot? Do they think, like, someone launched a teapot into the asteroid belt? Or, like, how did this teapot get there? I have so many questions now. Um... I've never heard of this. This is very interesting. Okay. Well, anyway. <laughs> um. That's weird. <laughs> okay, but let me show you what I meant about the teapot that I thought it was. Because I can actually show it here. And I think I did mention this in another, um, another video. But this, Sagittarius, it looks like, oh, you zoom in and it tells the names of them. Cool. Okay. Well, you zoom in and it has like this little handle and teapot and then the spout pours this way and then the spout, oh, you can see it. It is showing it. 
the spout is having steam, which is the Milky Way going out like that. So, that's cool. Um, but, <laughs> yeah. So, anyway, <laughs> now that I've tangented about teapots for a little bit, I'll go back to my other tangent about this class. So, basically, um, it was a situation- I will read this first. Um, Hubble's successor. As Hubble grew older, I'm assuming, just based on what this is about, this is referring to Hubble getting older, meaning the telescope getting older, not the guy named Hubble getting older. Um, as Hubble grew older, astronomers recognized the need for a newer, more high-tech successor. In 1996, the Next Generation Space Telescope project was conceived. It would be bigger, more powerful, and more advanced than its predecessor. Alright. Cool. Yes, anyway. So about the soil. <laughs> which I'm gonna have to stop to read this in just a second anyway. But, um, basically we were trying to do a few different things testing the soil here at this little farm, um, which I will talk more about right after this. This part is interesting. Okay. Um, the Next Generation Space Telescope Project gave birth to the James Webb Telescope, one of the most ambitious feats of astronomical engineering ever achieved. Improving on the foundations laid by Hubble, it introduced many significant innovations. Okay, anyway, so, basically, we, um, we went out and we tried to look at this soil and it was really 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 dry <laughs> because obviously it's June in a kind of drought affected area um, and it was just so we had these these meters that you're supposed to stick in the ground and um, they're interesting because they they don't have batteries or anything like electronic powering them they just you stick them in the ground they're kind of like a spike and they're supposed to tell you um the the humidity as well as the or not humidity but the the moisture content of the soil and also the ph of the soil and um, then we had to take a little sample of the soil and do like a soil core and try to figure out what type of soil it was. We got a lot of loam, sandy loam, and loamy sand were the three types that my group found. But, um, basically, there was one spot where we were able to get a pretty good soil core, um, but <laughs> the other two places, the one where we got the good soil core was an actual place called the wetland. It was like a lower area with more tree cover and it was shadier and all that. And so it was supposed to be like a wetland when it's been raining. Um, it had some, like, marsh plants and stuff in it. Um, but, so we did that, that place, and that was fine, and then we went to these other two places, and then they were out in the sun, and so the ground had basically been baked and really, really dried out. And also, um, <laughs> one of the spots had just been lawn mode because it had these really tall grasses that not only made it really difficult to walk through but also um were kind of a fire hazard because they were like really tall 
dried grass. Um, and so they had just been cut, and so it had also been compressed by a lawnmower machine thing going through. Um, and then <laughs> Cosmos came in, he's under the desk now, so he's snoring. Um, and then, so, the other place was basically like a fallow field, um, but it was also so dry and so packed that it was almost impossible to get a core, a soil core. I think typically you want like at least six inches of soil. We, at both of those places, were able to get like one or two inches. Um, so that was a bit difficult and then because of that it was really hard to get the instrument into the ground to measure the other things like the um ph i think it was doing ph correctly but our tool also just completely gave up on trying to do moisture the first one we went to it said it was zero percent saturated when we thought it was probably about 5 or 10% actually just by the feel of the soil. And then the one that was like completely solid, completely dried out uh, from the uh, where it was compressed down by the lawnmower, it said it was 93% moisture, which was absolutely not true at all. <laughs> and then the third site we tried to sample, it just refused to move at all. It, like, we tried to get it to change the reading to be what it was there, and it was just like, nah. And <laughs> that was probably because we couldn't get it deep enough into the really packed soil to actually have it covering the sensors that detect moisture, because the way it detects pH, I don't think it needed to be as completely covered by those, but it was just like, okay, this thing, this is not 93%. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's just, my teacher was like, yeah, definitely next year we're doing soil way earlier in the quarter because this is just not going well. <laughs> Um, but yeah, that's what I was doing last Friday, and then I got sunburned because of it, because I didn't have time in the morning to put on sunscreen. <laughs> um, and then the next day I went to my hometown, um, to visit my family, and I went to do a solar viewing with my dad with one of our telescopes at the local farmer's market. We put a solar filter on it and there's a couple other people with telescopes and we show people the sun and it's very fun and we get to inform them and <laughs> um, it's interesting because people have a lot of very different knowledge levels when it comes to the sun and what are sunspots and what are solar flares and all that stuff. Um, but we were out there and I got even worse sunburned. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's so interesting, like, because my dad gets really into talking about astronomy because it's something he's really interested in, but sometimes he talks about it like thinking that everyone else knows the same level of what he's talking about. And so he said to me after, because a few years ago we were doing this, and I pointed out to him, like, try and match the, like, age level you're talking to when you're explaining this. And he said after this one, um last weekend when we went, like, I think I'm finally starting to get better at explaining for different ages, and I was like, yay, good job! Um, but, yeah, it, it's really interesting, because, um, pretty recently, as of when we did this, was the thing where 
the aurora could be seen from parts of California, Oregon, like around that far south, which is kind of unusual. Um, and it was really cool. I actually have a video of slideshow pictures that I took of it, so if you haven't watched that, please watch it. It's very, very cool. Not just trying to get myself views here, but genuinely, it's so cool to be able to see it, and hopefully other people enjoy seeing it. But, um, yeah, it's just... A lot of people had heard about these, like, solar storms because of that, so they were asking, like, oh, is that what you're looking at? And the day that we did it, there was actually a really large solar prominence, and we were showing them and explaining that to them, and they were like, is that what makes the aurora? And so it was kind of fun getting to explain to people, and I had a lot of fun. There was a little kid, um... Her parents came over and were really interested in it and were talking to me and my dad and the other astronomers there. They were they thought it was super cool. But the little girl was super, super shy about actually looking in the telescope. And we had a step stool for kids to look through. Um, because one of the problems with kids in telescopes that we've found, and now we warn them before they even get on the step stool only to touch the step stool, is that a lot of kids are like, I'm too short, I'm gonna grab the eyepiece and pull it to my level. And if you know anything about telescopes, that you, you know that that's a problem because then it's not pointing at what it's supposed to be pointing at anymore. Um, but this little girl, she was probably like two or three, I don't know how to judge age very well, but pretty little. And it was fun because um, my dad and the other astronomer were both like really enthusiastically like, you want to see the sun? It's so cool. Look at it. And she was like hiding behind her mom. And I was like, I just kind of invited her mom to look through one of the telescopes. And her mom talked about how cool it was. And then I asked her like, you don't have to, but if you want to look, it's really cool. And she slowly went up the little step stool and looked through it. And she thought it was cool. And then I asked her if she wanted to see the others, and she was excited about it. So <laughs> I moved the step stool to all the different telescopes, and she got to look at all of them. And so that was pretty cool. And then it was so nice, because there was this older guy. He was... 86 and like I said this was during the farmers market so this it was pretty crowded area um, and we were kind of out in a lawn and but there were a lot of people like walking past and stuff and um, I saw him walk past and I was like do you want to look at the Sun that's what we're doing and he's like oh I'd love to but I ha I'm late to meet people for lunch um, but I really want to, and he ended up coming back, and he looked through all the telescopes, and then at the end he said, you know, I'm 86, and I've never seen anything like this. This was so cool. And that was just so fun to hear, because one of the things that I think is so cool about doing that is it's like, I grew up doing a lot of astronomy, whether it's just stargazing or whether it's using telescopes or watching documentaries about astronomy. Like, I, it's been a part of my life that I'm just, this goes so far up. <laughs> That's off topic. But it's, it's been something that I have just kind of grown up with and it's very easy to be like, ah, everyone's seen something through a telescope. Everyone's been able to like have a solar viewer and look at the sun or something. But that really is not the case at all. There are a ton of people who haven't. And it was just so cool that not only did we get to let this older guy get to have this experience he's never had in his entire life at 86, and he was so excited and thought it was so cool, we also got to have a really cool conversation with an older woman who was also very fascinated in it and was talking about like 
how far space and technology have come since, you know, her time growing up and what they talked about back then and the technology that existed then versus now, which is kind of fitting considering what this whole thing is about. Um, but then in the same day, we can also let this, like, really small child get exposed to astronomy in a way that isn't just like, oh, look at the night sky. It's like, you can look at the sun and it won't blind you or, <laughs> like, cause damage because we have special equipment. And we got to do that in the same day, and that's pretty cool because it's like, just being able to have that kind of experience of sharing that with people. Um, I like it because it's like, obviously people can sometimes come into like a school or something with a telescope and show a science class or something, but then that's like a very specific age range. But this is fun because you can show it to so many different people of so many different ages, and it's like this two-year-olds or however old it was has now seen something really cool. These little kids who are like a little bit older but like still young, I don't know exactly how old I would say they are, but probably like five to twelve. There's kind of a range of them. Uh, but they come up and they're like, I saw this thing about space, how does it work? Or, like, one time we had a kid who was probably like six or seven trying to ask my dad about magnetic fields and how those worked. And being able to kind of help encourage these interests. Also, this looks cool. <laughs> um, like, being able to kind of discuss these interests with kids who probably don't have the same resources that I did growing up of having a family who is very into astronomy, science, things. It's like, okay, here we have this little kid who's really interested in it and their parents don't really know the the way to answer their questions, and we can do that for them, and that's pretty cool. Um, but it's just so, so fun being able to reach this whole assortment of people with such different levels of interest and knowledge, but also, life experiences, like this 86 year old who had never seen the sun through a telescope and then this little really young kid who now has seen the sun through a telescope and if she goes on to completely forget that and ignore that and not care anymore that's fine but it could also cause her to become interested in astronomy more and kind of enjoy learning about astronomy more, which would also be cool. Um, so it's just kind of like, so fascinating to be able to just have all these different types of people and be able to talk about that and show people that. And that's kind of how I feel about my video I made of the Aurora. It's like, I'm not trying to just get people to watch my video because I need views. Um, I want people to watch it because I think it's a really cool thing and I want people to be able to see that and experience that because it is very cool in my opinion to have seen that and honestly seeing it in person the photos captured it a lot better than what we could see in the night sky. Like, it was, it was very cool to see, 
But at the same time, it was very... Um... I'm gonna rank up Ganymede a bit. It was very faint to just look at it and see it. It was like you could kind of see a bit of, you know, there's like a kind of pink tint, but it's more like when you see a glow in the sky from light pollution, more than like, oh, this is very clearly an aurora. It looked very pink compared to the sky around it, but it still didn't look anything as vibrant as the pictures that I took, but it was very cool. Although, on the topic of, like, I want people to watch it because they enjoy it, not because I just am desperate for views, I had a person contact me through Facebook the other day, um, which was interesting because I rarely ever use Facebook, I mostly use it to advertise my books and stuff like that, but, you know, it's like, she contacted me and was like, is this your channel? And she had a screenshot of this channel. and. She was, like, telling me all these things about how my views were not, like, optimized or something. <laughs> like, basically that I could get so many more views. And this is kind of similar to my rant about content creators that I had during this game a little while ago. But it's, like, she kept showing me like oh yeah like i can get you views and subscribers and whatever and it's like i don't want people to subscribe to me or watch my videos because they're being paid to or bought like i want people to watch what i create because they are interested in it or because they're enjoying it or because they want to. I don't care about the number of views for me, it's more about I want to have people who are actually engaged with what I'm making and wanting to watch it rather than people who are like, I pay someone to have people give me views, you know? And I don't actually know exactly how that works. And I know YouTube itself has the, like, promotions thing, which is a completely different thing. It is kind of a pay-for-views kind of thing, but it's, it's through YouTube, it's more like trying to get a wider reach on a particular video in order to find people who would actually be interested in it. Which I think is mm, very different than just paying for views, because it's like, then you're paying to offer your video to people who might actually be interested in it, and if they watch it and decide they like it and subscribe to you from that, then that's because they want to, not like paying random third parties to just give you artificial views and subscribers. Most of which I don't even think are actually real people. I don't actually know how that works, but <laughs> I don't know. That kind of thing has just never made sense to me because for me, I've never cared about follower number, subscriber count, anything like that. It's just like, I don't, need to have a ton of followers or subscribers. I appreciate it when people decide to subscribe to me. Not saying I don't like subscribers. I enjoy having people who want to watch my videos and engage with my videos. It's very nice to be able to create something that other people seem to be enjoying and 
seem to be wanting to come back to. Um, I especially like it when people comment and it seems like they've been watching several different things because then it's like, okay, that's cool because, you know, you seem like you're actually interested in this and I, I appreciate you taking the time to watch whatever I'm creating. Um, but whether I have, I would rather have like, currently I think I have about a thousand 770 subscribers, which is honestly crazy to me. That's way more than I was expecting to have ever. Um, but, you know, it's like I'd rather have that number of people who are watching and enjoying what I'm making than, I don't know, <laughs> like a million or 10,000 who just are paid to subscribe to me, you know? Also, I'm gonna read this now. Uh, James E. Webb. James E. Webb was NASA's administrator from 1961 to 1968 and oversaw the Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo programs. He used his many political connections to successfully lobby for funding, resources, and support for the space program. Nice. I've never seen what he looks like before. This is interesting. This is the one I need. Um, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, like, so, it's like, I don't know. I feel like people put so much value on quantity of subscribers, followers, views, all of that stuff. And it's like, sure, those things are great, but if you just have the most, that doesn't necessarily mean they're the best, you know? It's like, I want to have an audience that I can actually, like, engage with and connect with, and that's why when people comment, I always try to comment back, and I try to, even if I don't comment back, I try to like it or react in some way to the comment, just to show, like, yes, I see you, I appreciate taking the time to comment or make some sort of connection, um, and it's like, okay, that is something that I try to do because I have a smaller audience like I compared to those youtubers that have like millions of followers and subscribers it's like there's no way they can react to every comment even if they try even if they want to and I know that a lot of them do try to read their comments and engage with them there's no way they can respond to every single one and so that's why it's like, I don't want a ton if it loses the quality of, well, okay, it's not that. If I had more than I had now, I would be fine with having more. That's not what I'm saying. It's more like, if people are artificially subscribing to me, they're not actually there to actually want to be there, you know? I don't really feel like that's something that's very important or meaningful to me compared to having people who find my channel, watch my channel, and want to engage with my channel and follow it, like it, comment it, share it, whatever people do to videos, you know? It's like, <laughs> Cosmos is snoring again. It's like, it just feels like if, and I know this probably varies for different people, but for me it feels like if I started caring about number of things, it wouldn't be 
good or healthy for what I'm actually doing. Because, like I've mentioned before, I ultimately do this because I enjoy it and I have fun with it and I want to be able to share that with other people if I can, you know? It's like... People have commented, particularly on Stardew Valley, um, or my Cosmos videos, a lot of people comment on him, but it's like, you know, it's it's fun to get comments of people saying like, oh, I love watching this and it cheers me up or makes my day better or something. That's really fun to hear and to, you know, get feedback like that, but at the same time it's like, I would record videos because I'm having fun with it even if no one comments. Which, honestly, is most of my videos at this point. I have a couple of people who tend to comment regularly. Um, but overall, I don't have a ton of people who comment regularly on every single video. Um, and so it's like, if I suddenly became obsessed with, you know, I need to get comments and I need to get views and I need to get likes and I need to get subscribers and that's all I care about. I feel like it would make it much less fun for me and then lower the quality of what I'm able to create for other people. Um, and it would also probably just make the quality of what I did lower as well because I wouldn't be trying to, you know, make things that I would want to watch anymore. I would be making things that I think are going to get views no matter how bad they are, <laughs> which is not what I want to do, so... I don't know, it's just, it's, it's very strange to try and figure out the psychology of people who only really care about a number of things. Like, I don't know, it's, I feel like, and this, this goes beyond just like YouTube, I feel like there's a whole fundamental problem with this idea now of your follower number on whatever platform is your worth as a person um because that's not true at all <laughs> lots of really great people have very little following and maybe they are really great people and they don't even have social media like you know and then there's lots of really terrible people who have a really large following. So it's like, who you are as a person is not necessarily reflected by follower count. I feel like follower count, all that does is reflect how compelling you are for people to watch for good or bad reasons. And right now I don't have very many subscribers compared to a lot of really big YouTubers, you know? But at the same time it's like, but I've worked for them and this is the level I'm at right now. I've been posting or trying to post every day for over a year now. Um, I think apart from a little bit when I was really busy with traveling last summer, I have mostly been able to keep that schedule, um, and I've put a lot of work into this channel despite being a full-time student, and so it's like, okay, well, every time I get a new subscriber I'm really excited because it's like, I've been working on this, like, thank you for supporting me, but it isn't like, oh, I'm more valuable as a person right now, it's, it's like my, my work is paying off. But, 
I think that's especially harmful to like younger people than I am who have grown up in the social media age because when I was really young social media was kind of just taking off into the absolute chaos that it is now um you know like Facebook was talked about when I was in elementary school but a lot of these other things no one really had or were even invented yet until I was a little bit older but now there's like five-year-olds on TikTok which is concerning for a number of reasons. I personally don't use TikTok hardly at all. I don't spend time on it. I only post on it for my other channel and that's pretty much it. But it's like these kids are growing up with all of this pressure from social media on how they need to be and this pressure that being any kind of person means that you have to have like however many followers, subscribers, whatevers you have. And that is not the case and that's also not what very small children should be having to worry about or focus on. I don't know, I feel like this is a such a big issue but social media is like a very mixed, like, be careful what you wish for kind of situation. Because it's like, on one hand, people are able to find entertainment, people are able to, um, you know, share photos with friends and family and followers if they have larger followings, they are able to share news or promotional things like you know there there are definitely things about social media that are not terrible and some maybe even good but there are also absolutely some very large problems with social media and i think it's especially a problem when very young people have it, which obviously is a thing where every parent or family will have their own way of doing that and they'll have to figure out for themselves how they want to do that, you know? It's, it's not really anyone else's business, but I do feel like tech addiction, which is slightly separate, but it's a really big problem in not just young people, but like society as a whole right now. But at the same time, especially in young kids, it's damaging because growing up with that, it's like when I was growing up, my form of entertainment was like toys and blocks and running around outside and playing games with my friends or my parents or doing art projects or you know tons of stuff and i think it helps that my mom was a preschool teacher because she had a lot of really cool art stuff and really cool toys and stuff and i know that not everyone has access to those things however <laughs> i do think that that helped so much with like creativity and wanting to like spend time doing things without like being glued to a screen even now and i love books and i love paper books much more than i like e-reader type books not to say I don't read online or on a screen, because I do, but I, I way prefer paper books, and now it's like people don't read anymore, first of all, but even people who do, it's like I read on my Kindle or my whatever other reading product I have, 
nook, I guess. Um, and it's like, but uh, paper plate. <laughs> uh, so it's just like I don't know. I feel like something is being lost by all of the tech, and I think that it's like. I feel very fortunate that my family actually didn't let me use technology when I was really young. Um, and I think that if I were to ever have kids, whether they're my own or adopted or however, I don't know what I'm going to have or if I'm going to have anything. But <laughs> I think... I would also probably not let them have their own electronic devices until they're at least late elementary school or early middle school. Um, like these people who give one year olds iPads, like. Uh, like I said, as <laughs> everyone has their own decisions and their own way of doing things. But it's like, why does a one-year-old need one? Why can't a one-year-old be entertained by their parents, their babysitter, their toys, their whatever in their life is entertaining? that isn't relying on a screen and it's like i think it was around late late elementary school like sixth grade when i started having to do a lot more um like typed work for school um and so my parents bought me a used computer, and I was able to have that for, um, being able to work on primarily schoolwork, but I kind of got to do a little bit of what I wanted on it. Like, they didn't let me just go to whatever, like, I wasn't going around the dark web in elementary school or anything. Not that I'm going around the dark web now, but, like, you know, they were, they were still kind of supervising but it was like kind of my computer I could do what I wanted with um rather than before always having to ask my dad if I could use his if I wanted to type something or play something um but it wasn't until like toward the end of eighth grade that I got a phone when there were people when I was in like fifth grade or fourth grade who had phones and it's one of those things, like, when you're a kid, you're like, but that person has it, why can't I have that? <laughs> and it, I was a little bit like that. But looking back, it's like, you know, I'm happy I didn't have one back then. There were times when I wished I had it if I needed to, like, contact my parents or something. But really, it's... I was able to do so much more without one that I feel like having one would have, I don't know, distracted from. Um, and so I feel like if I ever had a kid, that's probably what I would do. I don't know. It's, it's a weird thing to think about. I have seen so many people, speaking of social media, recently that I know, getting engaged, married, having kids, and it's weird to me. I'm 23 right now. The idea of any of those is so weird to me. I'm not currently in a relationship, so that might be part of it. But it's just like, you're just still so young. <laughs> I don't know. I guess people are certain about what they want in their futures or something. I'm not sure. <laughs> but that feels like, uh, I don't know. <laughs> like, nothing against people who want to get married or have kids at my age. I know tons of people do. It just feels so young. Like, <laughs> 
I'm still in school. I know lots of people my age are, you know, graduating or already working or things like that. My best friend is actually graduating this weekend from undergrad and I'm really happy for her. Um, but, you know, it's just like, okay, <laughs> like, we're 23 and you're having kids and getting married and, like, oh, Okay, but also, whoa. <laughs> it might be because my mom didn't have me until her mid 40s and my dad was like late 30s when I was born that that seems really, really, really young. And I know that for my parents it was like relatively older. Um, but it's just like 23, really? <laughs> But then again, I'm only a year younger than my cousin-in-law was when she married my cousin. So it's like, huh. Interesting. <laughs> also, this is like a completely different generation, so this is very different. But my grandma had her- f she got married when she was 20 and had her first child when she was 22, which- Ugh, I know that was common back, back then, but that seems so young. I don't know. It's just, it's weird. <laughs> Human social marriage standards are just so strange <laughs> sometimes. I don't know. It might also just be because I have things I'm much more interested in than relationships or intimacy or anything like that. <laughs> But, I don't know, maybe people who are more interested in those things want these things more. I'm not sure. <laughs> I bet- okay, I know for a fact that one of the people that got married when we were like... 20... <laughs> um... Married someone they met five months before the wedding. Not the engagement, the wedding. They knew each other for five months when they were married. And I know that they are, like, super religious. So probably they got married because they want to sleep together. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I've read this one already. Yeah, but, you know, it's just like, okay. I've read this one, too. Um, I just definitely certain things where it's like, mm, are you getting married for the right reasons? I don't know. Okay. I read this one, too. This is new. Rats are notorious as a vector for disease due to their high population numbers, frequent infiltration of urban areas in proximity to humans. Sometimes they are a host for diseases themselves, but more frequently carry fleas that transfer the diseases to humans. So, yeah. I read this one before, too. Okay, flat tail. Beavers' broad, flat tails serve many functions. They help to balance the animal when it is chewing on trees, can be used as a rub rudder while swimming, and stores fat that helps the beaver to regulate its body temperature in summer and winter. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. It's... It's weird. Anyway, um, Burial. Death is the last great mystery. I read this one already. Neolithic. Let's get it. Read that one. I read that one. I read that one. <laughs> Alright. Is this? 
this this is the same philosophy one that happened before. So it looks like they just rotate, maybe. Anyway. Um <laughs> Yeah. I don't know. Relationships and marriage and all that is just so far from something that I'm really prioritizing right now that seeing all these people my age like marrying each other is really strange okay <laughs> anyway distance from earth unlike hubble web won't orbit earth instead it will orbit the sun 1.5 million kilometers from home this meant the launch had to go exactly as planned since repairs would be impossible once the telescope is in space yeah Oh, that's cool. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. And I, I'm not judging people who do get married. This is something where I want to be careful saying this. Um, like, people who get married, it, that's up to them and their partner and sometimes their family, it depends on the situation. But for me personally, the idea of being married at my age is very weird. background is interesting. Also, this is interesting because I came into this super late, like, with only 14 something hours left, and I'm already in position 352, whereas the deep sea one, I was like, I never got below 500. And I wonder if that's just because there's way more interest for Deep Sea than for this, or whether it's finals week for everyone who plays this game? I don't know. <laughs> but, you know, I would think space would be relatively equal to Deep Sea curiosity of people playing this game. I mean, there's a whole Beyond section about space. Maybe they don't care because they already have that, and there isn't like a C specific. I mean, primary has aquatic things. I will, in fact, make them explode right now. Not explode, but do their whole cool firework thing that they do. <laughs> like this and this and this i wish these guys all just fell out of a clump and went to their places they are oh it's cute it's eating this one's eating an actual plant these guys just bite nothing. Nom. 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 <laughs> He's just biting nothing. I love them so much. I don't know what it is about these turtles. They're my favorite thing in primary. Ooh, this looks cool now. Oh, I like this view with the water and the little 
pink trees, that's cool. Whoa! <laughs> I've never really taken a lot of time to look around. Whoa. Person. I'm in the wall, that's not what I meant to do. Get out of camera mode. Help. Okay. Ah, oh, I'm still there. Okay. No. There we go. People. Guy. Person. Small child. Oh, dead person is there. Yep. That's morbid, because Shay looks pregnant and she's got this small child and they're both looking at this. I'm assuming that's the other parent. That is morbid. I mean, that, that I'm sure that happened a lot in the Stone Age. Morbid, anyway. <laughs> that's fine. I should go switch out my dark matter thing, because I think it's done by now. Yep. Saturn's almost done. I level it up while it is. Yeah. Oh, it's so close. <laughs> I want Vesta, but I cannot get it yet. But I want it. I'm so close. Ah, I will get it later. I think I am going to leave this episode here for now. I'll probably try and come back before this is done because I really want to learn more about this. And I know I could do that through other means in this game, but it's so interesting learning it here, so I will probably try and come back later tonight, or very early tomorrow morning after midnight sometime, because, you know, why not, and I'll hopefully be able to get things earning some in that time, um, but for now, I'm gonna leave this episode here. Thanks for listening to all my random tangents again. <laughs> Thank you all so much for watching. I hope you liked it. If you did, please like, comment, and subscribe, and I'll see you next time. Bye!